You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Okay, you're about to hear my interview with Shamindi Punyadira, so I hope it works. Uh, Shamindi was very nice, very accommodating. Again, as I mentioned, she just came back from traveling, was jet-lagged, but still took the time to speak to me. Shamindi is focused on uh, several different types of cancer, neck and uh, head cancers, glioblastoma, and um, one other kind. So we talked about uh, how she wants to use what's called a liquid biopsy, looking at your saliva, or your blood, and finding out if you're about to have cancer, if you have cancer, how advanced it is, etc. Why is liquid so much better than a regular biopsy? Because who wants to have a needle jabbed into their neck or, you know, a a piece of their pancreas taken out or their stomach or whatever it is? I would much rather have my saliva sampled or my blood. And according to what Shamindi says, it's going to be give a lot more information to do these liquid biopsies. So it's a huge very promising area of medicine. Unfortunately, if you know someone who has cancer, God forbid, if you have cancer yourself, as I've had, um, if you're facing cancer or if you know someone, and unfortunately, chances are many listeners too, because it's so prevalent, uh, you'll want to pay attention to this podcast because it reveals what's coming in the next uh, 5, 10, 15 years, hopefully less than 15, uh, about new ways to biopsy and find out what's going on with us and uh, how we can be helped with medicine. So definitely listen in. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Finding Genius podcast. I have a guest from far away in Australia, uh, Shamindi Punyadira. She got up really early to do this podcast, and I, I appreciate it. I have the luxury of doing this in the afternoon. I'm wide awake, and Shamindi got up like super early after just traveling. So uh, you know, I'll try to be nice to her. But uh, Shamindi, thanks for coming. How are you doing? Uh, good morning. Hi. I'm all right. Thank you. Well, good. Well, uh, tell me about um, your work. I know that you're working on cancer biology, and it looks like specifically uh, possibly head and neck cancers or maybe other disorders. Tell me about your work. What do you research? Um, Before I um, start um, talking about the research that we are doing in my team, I would like to uh, start off by saying why it is important, uh, why is it important to do the research that we are doing? So healthcare costs are increasing globally due to a growing and an aging population. Um, We are trying to develop non-invasive diagnostic tools to detect diseases early, in particular cardiovascular disease and cancer. Um, The three types of cancer that we are researching currently are on head and neck cancers, uh, lung cancer, and glioblastoma. We are using human saliva as a medium to identify disease-specific biomarkers in saliva. You may be wondering why saliva. Saliva collection is easy, non-invasive, and multiple samples can be collected by an individual. And it's also ideal for rural and uh, remote setting. Um, In addition to salivary diagnostic, we are also using liquid biops to diagnose and predict treatment responses in cancer patients. Liquid biopsy, by definition, is the use of body fluids such as blood and saliva in place of tumor tissues to manage cancer patients. The rationale for using liquid biopsies are as follows. Well, I think I know the, the rationality is that I've had uh, you know, thyroid cancer myself and I had a, a biopsy of like, you know, nodules in my neck and it's no fun to have a, a needle plunged into you and stuff aspirated out. So I would have loved to have instead just a, uh, give a saliva sample or a blood sample, it's a lot less invasive. And I'm sure for a lot of cancers, it's far more invasive than what I went through. So I, I think 
I think that would be a big reason why it would be nice. Um, yes, and I'm, I'm so, so sorry that you had thyroid cancers, but thyroid cancer prognosis is about more than 90%. So it's kind of a good type of cancer to have compared to head and neck cancers where survival yeah. is 50%. Percent. Yeah, actually, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad it happened because it changed my perspective on things. I, I feel lucky because I, it, I guess, knock wood, at least so far, everything looks good. And if you're going to get cancer, it's probably one of the best ones you can get, which is a weird thing to say. So. Absolutely. Let me just go back and touch upon why liquid biopsies in place of traditional tumor tissue. Because tissue biopsies are invasive. And some locations are difficult to access, such as when you get tumors in the lung and the brain. Secondly, single biopsy can miss relevant tumor clones due to intrapatient tumor heterogeneity. And lastly, sequential tissue biopsies in individual patients for real-time monitoring of therapy responses are less feasible, actually, in a clinical practice setting. So these well, are- let me, let me ask you a quick question here. I, you mentioned that tumors are heterogeneous, meaning they're not all one thing, one cell expression type. So, yeah, you're right. If you do a biopsy, there's no guarantee that you'll get enough of the heterogeneity to really understand the tumor, I guess, right? Absolutely. Let's just take your example uh, uh, for a second. Um, for thyroid cancers, you said you did a fine needle uh, biopsy. How yeah. do we know that you actually get the tumor cells? because the um, tumor itself is quite heterogeneous. You need to do, be doing multiple biopsies to be right. able to get a pic actual picture of the tumor tissue itself. But in uh, liquid biopsies, when you are using circulating tumor cells, for instance, these are the cells that are disseminated from both primary and metastatic sites, and they actually represent the actual clone that's giving rise to secondary meds. I guess the trade-off is, um, you know, you may be getting differing signals from, I don't know, 20 different, uh, you know, I, well, I don't know if you want to call them cell types, but in a tumor, you know, what do you call the different cells that make up the heterogeneous tumor? They're not, they have, I guess they have different epigenetics, uh, different gene expression, but what do you call them? Are they called cell types or what are they called? So it's both cell types, so different cell types, because it's a tumor microenvironment which means uh, the interactions of tumor cells or epithelial cells with immune cells, stroma cells, that whole interaction is what leads to uh, cancer. So by sampling one cell types, you would not get the actual uh, expression of different markers in the whole tumor tissue. So uh, okay. um, using liquid biopsies, you do, because it's the clone that can um, resist in blood gives rise to secondary meds. So you know that that clone will, be, uh, will give uh, a secondary meds and you are able to isolate and characterize these cells from a cancer patient's blood sample. Okay, so whatever <clears throat> biomarkers you're looking at, you can look at the relative uh, prevalence of the different markers that could come from tumors and meta you know, metastatic sites. Okay, I see what you mean. So. But what, what are the biomarkers you'd look at in a liquid biopsy? What are examples of some of them? Uh, so, so, as I said, liquid biopsy, by definition, is using liquid uh, such as saliva or blood in place of tumor tissues. Uh, so, in my team, we have developed a workflow to isolate and enrich circulating tumor cells from cancer patients' blood. This is really important because... Uh, uh, circulating tumor cells, or in short, CTCs, these are rare cells. These are about one to five cells per uh, seven mils of blood sample. So, you know, it's like finding a needle in a haystack. And it's really important, the first step, the enrichment step, because you may miss CTCs because these are very, very rare events. But with our workflow, we are quite confident uh, that we can isolate, detect these CTC. And secondly, um, we are also using cell-free DNA. So this is the DNA that's secreted into the blood or saliva through apoptotic events, necrosis. And we are looking at the uh, genetic profile 
of this uh, cell-free DNA, which is called then ctDNA. And what we do in uh, head and neck cancers is that we are monitoring minimal residual disease using ctDNA. Currently, there are FDA-approved platform for uh, using cDNA in non-small cell lung cancer and uh, breast cancer. We are also using exosomes. These are extracellular vesicles that are secreted into either blood or saliva. And these are called the cargos. These are the um, vesicles that communicate between different cell types. So a actually a cancer cell can uh, direct a normal cell to become cancer cell. So this, these uh, exosomes are really important both biologically and clinically. So these are the type oh, of uh, biomarkers. Question here, question here. Yeah. so you were saying that <clears throat> cancer cells are very few in the blood, for instance, or in the saliva. <clears throat> what about um, exosomes from cancer cells? Are those a lot more prevalent? And can you even identify, oh yeah, these exosomes are from cancer cells? Because I would think there's exosomes from all kinds of cells in the blood or saliva. How would you ever tease them out? Absolutely spot on. So exosome uh, biogenesis or exosome secretion is a physiological event. So even in um, healthy cells, normal cells, they secrete exosomes. And the exosome cargo content secreted from a cancer cell differs uh, from a normal uh, healthy cells. Let's take, for example, um, a breast cancer you could detect HER2 receptors in exosomes secreted from a breast cancer patient compared to uh, healthy uh, cells. So we are actually looking at the cargo in uh, extra vesicles, not per se the extra vesicles because these molecules are the same, but the cargo differs between normal and healthy cells. A normal and, and, and healthy cells. Even though the, um, all right, so even though there's many different types of exosomes, you can identify ones associated with cancer or, you know, from cancer cells. Um, how numerous are the exosomes? Do you have any idea? And is it, you know, if they're very numerous, does that make it easier to gauge their signal and, and uh, you know, see them versus the tumor cells themselves that are in blood? So we are just now finalizing a research article on isolation and characterization of exosomes from head and neck cancer uh, patients um, using saliva as a diagnostic fluid. So we do get a large number of, I think, 10 to the 6 particles um, in uh, saliva of cancer patients. And more so, we are using a battery of markers to characterize exosomes. We are using CD963, uh, 81 as markers, as well as we are using cryo-SCMs because exosomes are between 50 nanometers to about 150 nanometers. So when you isolate these uh, exosomes, you have to really characterize them to show that these are extra, uh, these are exosomes and not um, other extracellular vesicles such as apoptotic uh, bodies or multivesicular bodies. So in order to uh, see what the cargo is for exosomes, do you have to like ultra centrifuge a sample down and would that break open the, um, the membranes of the exosomes and spill their contents and you look for like specific RNA signatures inside them or, or can you yes. preserve the exosomes and look at them that way? So we are using, I mean, there are a large number of exosome isolation protocols, but we are using uh, ultra centrifugation and um, we can also freeze these exosomes and we've never had a problem of uh, exosome bursting or things like that. So yes, you can um, store exosomes and then you can um, do gene expression, microRNA expression to identify tumor uh, specific signatures in these exosomes. And what you normally do is you isolate exosomes from let's say a cancer patient, in this case, head and neck cancer patient saliva and you have a healthy uh, control group where you also isolate exosomes. And then you compare the cargo between the two groups. So are you looking, are you trying to find early incidence of disease or are you trying to find, you know, how advanced a particular cancer is? Like what's, what's more of the goal here or is it both? So for us, we are using it to early 
detect uh, cancer events, in, in fact, in pre-malignant stage, as well as to stratify patients at diagnosis to see whether a patient is in an early stage versus a late stage of cancer. How do you, yeah, how do you stratify? Does the nature of the exosomes or the nature of the tumor cells that are in the blood or saliva, does that change? Um, you know, does a primary tumor establish first and then grow to a certain size and then metastasize and maybe the nature of the exosomes put out changes and the cells put out changes? Yeah, so let's take uh, throat cancer, which is called also oropharyngeal uh, cancer, which is caused by human papilloma virus. So the two high-risk groups are 16 and 80. And we've collected and uh, isolated, characterized HPV-16 DNA in the exosomes of uh, these cancer patients. So you get a large number of if a patient is from an advanced stage versus an early stage, which is, I think, pretty um, obvious because early stage cancers, you have small tumors compared to late stage cancers or metastatic cancers. So uh, in that way, we can see whether a patient is from a early stage versus late stage cancer. Okay. So the number increases dramatically, I guess, because the tumor is in constant growth mode. So as the tumor grows, more and more of its cells are pumping out exosomes saying, let's spread, let's spread. <laughs> You know, are communicating whatever they're communicating. We don't know, but uh, that's why the correlation. And it's a really a fascinating field because just take, uh, uh, now I'm going to uh, deviate a little bit from cancer into cardiovascular disease or heart failure because that's a systemic event. We can detect uh, cardiac specific markers such as cardiac uh, troponin I in saliva. And I have not been able to prove it, but I think exosomes are the uh, uh, reasons why we can detect these uh, heart-specific markers in saliva. So literally exosomes link between saliva and the blood, and we can use yeah. saliva as a proxy to detect systemic events. Are you, um, I wonder, well, this may be off topic, but I wonder if people are, are able to determine large sinks for exosomes you know let's say they go into the blood and the saliva but are there any areas where the exosomes really tend to fall off quickly you know like um let's say you do a blood sample if you do it from the arm do you think you'd see a different profile of exosomes from the leg or from if you took blood from you know like a central line um that's an interesting uh very interesting research questions i am not sure whether that has been looked at um, our focus thus far has been on saliva. So uh, we literally take about um, half a mil of saliva and we isolate exosomes from saliva and we hope that it's more homogeneous. But I can answer that uh, with the circulating tumor cells. Studies have shown that if you uh, use right arm versus left arm, the number of CTCs you get are different. So let's say like, left arm gives you three CTCs, right arm gives you five CTCs. Okay. Hmm. Well, since you're sampling saliva, I know that, you know, and this will go into another area, there's different microbial constituents based on, you know, any fluid you sample, blood, you know, saliva, et cetera. So if you're going to sample saliva, have you tried sampling from different areas in the mouth you know, that have different microbial constituents and maybe that changes what you're able to see. I don't know. Maybe not. That might be something to look at. Uh, so there are three main methods of uh, sampling saliva. One is called unstimulated saliva. Like as, I, as I'm sitting, you can tilt your head down and you can pull saliva in a resting mode. That is unstimulated saliva. But sadly, most of our cancer patients... Um, post-treatment, they have impaired salivary glands. So they are unable to secrete in sufficient saliva. In that way, we, we give them a lemon lolly. So that's called acid-stimulated uh, saliva. Or we can give them some, something like something to chew, and that is called mechanically stimulated saliva. Concentration of biomolecules are more in unstimulated saliva versus uh, stimulated uh, saliva. And because we are using uh, whole mouth saliva, 
which is secreted from the three major glands plus the minor glands. It kind of represents the whole oral cavity. And we are not particularly using uh, or swabbing just on the tongue or at the back of the mouth, but the whole mouth saliva. So let's take the microbial compositions. They do differ. There have been studies where they have sampled different parts of the oral cavity and they find different bugs. Uh, I wouldn't call different microbials living in the oral cavity. But uh, we are targeting human specific uh, gene expressions and not microbial specific gene expression. So the primers that we design are human specific. So you really are not amplifying the microbial communities, but you are looking at the expression changes in human cells, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, I gotcha. Hmm. So, um, interesting. What, in terms of, uh, well, I didn't ask you about the heart risk factors. What can you see by looking at uh, saliva about the heart and the cardiovascular system? Like, What kind of things can you look for? What kind of markers? What does that tell you? Yeah. So we are working on uh, heart failure because it's uh, heart failure by definition is the inability of the heart to pump sufficient blood to the body. And there are over 38 million people globally diagnosed with heart failure. And uh, sadly, 50% of them die within five years. We have been, so when we started this program about 10 years ago, what we started off with, can, the premise was that, can we detect current diagnostic uh, uh, biomarkers such as NT, pro BNP in saliva of uh, heart failure patients? And yes, we can detect uh, NT, pro BNP, which is a current blood-based diagnostic uh, biomarker in saliva, but the concentration ranges are low in saliva. In saliva, you get them in picogram per mil ranges, and as such, you need highly sensitive immunoassays to be able to pick the low concentrations in saliva. I did mention about the cardiac troponin I, and we also saw a correlation between cardiac troponin I levels in blood and saliva, which indicates that what is in the blood is what's getting filtered into saliva. So we could use cardiotropin I as a marker in saliva. And in addition to that, we've also done a discovery approach uh, where we have identified, uh, where we have used mass spectrometry to identify and validate uh, a panel of protein to detect heart failure, which we have file a patent and which has now been licensed to an Australian based startup company. Okay. Interesting. Well, why do you think that you're able to see markers in blood and saliva? But is it that the heart is in a stressed state and therefore it's communicating what's going on with it? Or is the heart always communicating through the use of, let's say, exosomes about its state? So if we look at if you take salivary glands, these have to be functional. So they have capillary networks. And studies have shown that biomolecules can move from blood into saliva by uh, uh, diffusion, um, active transport. There are different mechanisms how molecules get transported across the blood endothelium into the salivary acini cell. These are the salivary gland cells. So there's continuous flux or continuous traffic between blood and saliva. And these molecules continuously move either side. And we can actually capture this uh, transportation of these molecules at a certain time when you uh, sample um, saliva. And uh, I'll give you an example. Um, we have, so let's go back to our oropharyngeal cancer case and we have been able to detect HPV-16 DNA in salivary oral rinse samples from cancer patients. And when you remove the tumor, salivary oral um, HPV DNA content uh, is decreased, which means that this is a good marker to diagnose and predict a treatment response in oropharyngeal cancer patients. Mm. Okay, that makes sense. What what other nuances, you know, so you want, we all want early detection, which would be great, but what about the overall functioning of, 
someone's cardiovascular system? Are you looking at all at healthy people, maybe looking at them over time or under different conditions, stress conditions, and seeing what shows up in the saliva or blood? You know, again, how much uh, broadcasting of the state of the system of the body, you know, the, again, what the heart's doing or what the cardiovascular system's doing is happening on a regular basis. Have you looked at that baseline? So um, we have actually uh, collect, uh, collected um, about 800 uh, samples from as part of one of the largest longitudinal trial, clinical trials conducted in Australia, which is called uh, Screen Heart Failure Program, where, um, these, um, where Monash has been very kind enough to um, collect saliva samples from high-risk individuals. So these are uh, people at risk of developing heart failure. These could be people with type 2 diabetes, obesity, people who have previously had heart attacks. Um, and what we now want to do is to compare the uh, saliva uh, markers or proteins in this high-risk group to control group and see whether we can discriminate these two groups. If we can discriminate these two groups with a high sensitivity and specificity, we have a marker to start screening within a, uh, a population. Mm. But uh, right, we, so, yeah, so yeah. we have collected the samples, but sadly I haven't been able to get research funding. So I have kind of uh, parked that project until I get funding to start uh, looking at uh, the expression changes between these two cohorts of uh, pe uh, people. But I guess the good thing you mentioned is that if it's exosomes, they're stable. And they could be frozen, so perhaps long term they could be stored, and then when you're ready, look at them. Absolutely, and even saliva, we collect the way we process and store saliva. We can uh, keep salivary protein without being degraded for a longer time. Oh, interesting. Okay. Well, excellent. What? Um, so, just to state it very clearly, what what do you think will be the outcomes for human health, you know, over the next few years because of your research? What's your goals there? Um, so. I think uh, what we want to uh, drive is a precision medicine approach. So in other words, giving the, right, uh, um, um, giving the right patient the right therapy, the right time, uh, right time. So if you do recall 2015 President Obama's uh, Moonshot Initiative, which means that uh, identifying the genetic uh, profile of a patient and providing the treatment to that patient cohort, which is Christian medicine or personalized medicine. And liquid biopsies will be the answer to accelerate Christian medicine. I mean, we all know that one glove fits all doesn't work in uh, clinical practice anymore. So it's the uh, evolution of Christian medicine approaches using liquid biopsy and tailoring a cancer treatment for a particular patient group. Uh, just uh, take an example of the poster child of uh, personalized medicine is um, Herceptin, drug Herceptin, which is given to 20% of breast cancer patients who have overexpression of HER2. So mm. something like that would be possible. I am very confident for head and neck. And in lung cancer, they are already uh, doing that type of um, work where patients with, um, let's say, EGFR mutations, they get tyrosine kinase uh, inhibitors. So you can stratify patient groups and deliver treatment based on their genetic profile. This will be the future. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Um, have you gotten to a point where you could look at the, um, you know, what's being expressed, the biomarkers across patients at a similar stage in a, with, a, with the same type of cancer or the apparent same type of cancer to see the variation? Yeah. Yes. So we've been very fortunate um, last year, and I have to acknowledge the funding body, um, Cancer Australia have been very generous and they have uh, given us uh, research funding to conduct a longitudinal trial. And this longitudinal trial, what we are aiming is to see whether we can use circulating tumor cells at diagnosis as a prognostic biomarker 
in head and neck cancer patients. So we collect uh, saliva and blood samples at baseline 13th week. The reason why we are collecting at 13th week is that's when they get a PET CT scan and that's when a clinician can evaluate whether the patient has, patient has responded partially or completely or whether the patient still has minimal residual disease. And then we collect uh, uh, samples every six months for two year period. The reason why we select a two year window is that most of the head and neck cancer patients recurrences occur within two years. And mm. we are collecting uh, uh, blood samples from 100 patients and we have currently collected at least at baseline 59 uh, samples with follow up. And initial results indicate that yes, at diagnosis, we can say which patients will develop recurrences and who won't develop recurrences. This is a huge, this will change literally the current clinical practice in managing head and neck cancer patients. So we are really thrilled with these initial findings yeah, and yeah. looking forward to completing this trial in the next uh, few years. <clears throat> Know that someone's going to have a uh, reoccurrence or not? What tells you that? What's the difference? So, um, if you look at the CTCs at uh, baseline, and let's look at the CTCs at uh, 13th week, circulating tumor cells, uh, if a patient is responding, should decrease. Let's say at baseline you have 10 CTCs, and post treatment, if it decreases like into 5, 3, 2, 1, you can see that within two year patient is responding as opposed to you have uh, five CTCs and the CTCs keep on increasing. Then you know that the patient is not responding. Also another marker that's currently being used in, in clinical practice like uh, foundation medicine and uh, uh, guardian, guardian 360, they're using CT DNA and uh, tumor uh, profiles, not uh, mutation profiles to detect minimal residual disease in lung cancer patients and breast cancer patients. And we would like to do a similar thing in head and neck cancer patients. Okay. So, all right. Is this, so you're observing these biomarkers um, pre-treatment and post-treatment. Let's say you observe them pre-treatment. What if you did it over a couple of time periods and you saw that, you know, the CTCs were increasing tremendously fast and in some other people they were slower and then if you also did a post-treatment and you saw they're falling off fast versus falling off slow or not at all I mean I would think that both sampling periods would really help you characterize what's happening with someone yeah uh, so uh, for in head and neck cancer patients so if the uh, tumor is um, let's say oropharyngeal cancer patients or uh, throat cancer patients they basically get uh, chemo radiation uh, as opposed to oral cavity cancers or mouth cancers where they remove it uh, surgically. If, uh, for instance, you see that the CTCs are increasing, a clinician could intervene and do multimodality treatment, surgery plus chemo radiation or cetuximab or immune therapy. You see, you have more option to aggressively treat the patient at early onset rather than late onset, uh, where you, the survival will be less than 50%. Hmm. Well, I guess, again, you could also characterize the degree of aggressiveness of their cancer if, you know, by looking at biomarkers and seeing their rapid change versus their slow change. Absolutely. Yes, you're right. Okay. And again, because it's, you know, it's not invasive and it can better characterize what's going on. It can be done more times. It probably will be a lot cheaper and it'll lead to better care for people. Uh, yes, so liquid biopsies, I mean, just take, for example, a cancer patients who had surgery. How do you track this patient's uh, disease progression or regression? Because the tumor is removed, what do you use? You use either saliva and blood biomarkers to track this patient's uh, treatment response. Because once the tumor is re removed, unless you have a you, uh, in an unfortunate case, you develop a secondary metastasis. There is no tumor to track, but you can get the biomarker profiles to track or biomarker profiles or tracking. Okay, I see what you mean. Well, very good. I mean, there's a lot of promise, a lot of work to do as usual, but uh, this is great. So 
Shimindi, what's what's the best way for people to learn more about what you're doing and read papers and interact and, and ask questions, maybe? So I would actually direct them to uh, QUT. So I'm from Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, Australia. And our library is running uh, ePrints. So all our research articles are on, if you put my name, Shimindi Punyadira, QUT ePrints, you can download all the research articles. And I do a large number of TV, media, and um, talks. And I'm also engaged with the community where I go do a lot of community events and explain the importance of early diagnosis of uh, cancer and uh, cardiovascular disease. So if we just put my name and QUT ePrints, you can get uh, all the articles that we have published from my team. Okay, well, that's great. Well, Chimindi, I know, again, it's early. You've had a lot of travel and all that, but I really appreciate you being here. It's been a great call, and thank you so much. And thank you so much for doing this, because it's as researchers, we really rely on funding. And the more we can communicate our research outcomes to the public, then we can hopefully in the future get uh, funding to do this exciting um, research where we can do a paradigm shift in clinical practice. Well, very good. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Thank you.